Chapter Three of Frederick the Great by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The general principles on which this strange government was conducted deserve attention. The policy of Frederick was essentially the same as his father's, but Frederick, while he carried that policy to lengths which his father never thought of carrying it, cleared it at the same time from the absurdities with which his father had encumbered it. The king's first object was to have a great, efficient, and well-trained army. He had a kingdom which in extent and population was hardly in the second rank of European powers, and yet he aspired to a place not inferior to that of the sovereigns of England, France, and Austria. For that end it was necessary that Prussia should be all sting. Louis the Fifteenth, with five times as many subjects as Frederick, and more than five times as large a revenue, had not a more formidable army. The proportion which the soldiers in Prussia bore to the people seems hardly credible. Of the males in the vigour of life, a seventh part were probably under arms, and this great force had, by drilling, by reviewing, and by the unsparing use of cane and scourge, been taught to perform all evolutions with a rapidity and a precision that would have astonished Villars or Eugene. The elevated feelings which are necessary to the best kind of army were then wanting to the Prussian service. In those ranks were not found the religious and political enthusiasm which inspired the pikemen of Cromwell, the patriotic ardour, the thirst of glory, the devotion to a great leader which inflamed the old guard of Napoleon, but in all the mechanical parts of the military calling the Prussians were as superior to the English and French troops of that day as the English and French troops to a rustic militia. Though the pay of the Prussian soldier was small, even though every Rixdollar of extraordinary charge was scrutinized by Frederick with a vigilance and suspicion such as Mr. Joseph Hume never brought to the examination of an army estimate, the expense of such an establishment was, for the means of the country, enormous. In order that it might not be utterly ruinous, it was necessary that every other expense should be cut down to the lowest possible point. Accordingly, Frederick, though his dominions bordered on the sea, had no navy. He neither had nor wished to have colonies. His judges, his fiscal officers, were meanly paid. His ministers at foreign courts walked on foot or drove shabby old carriages till the axle-trees gave way. Even to his highest diplomatic agents, who resided in London and Paris, he allowed less than a thousand pounds sterling a year. The royal household was managed with a frugality unusual in the establishments of opulent subjects, unexampled in any other palace. The king loved good eating and drinking, and during the great part of his life took pleasure in seeing his table surrounded by guests, yet the whole charge of his kitchen was brought within the sum of two thousand pounds sterling a year. He examined every extraordinary item with a care which might be thought to suit the mistress of a boarding-house better than a great prince. When more than four rix-dollars were asked of him for a hundred oysters, he stormed as if he had heard that one of his generals had sold a fortress to the Empress Queen. Not a bottle of champagne was uncorked without his express order. The game of the royal parks and forests, a serious head of expenditure in most kingdoms, was to him a source of profit. The whole was farmed out, and though the farmers were almost ruined by their contract, the king would grant them no remission. His wardrobe consisted of one fine gala dress, which lasted him all his life, of two or three old coats fit from Monmouth Street, of yellow waistcoats soiled with snuff, and of huge boots embrowned by time. One taste alone sometimes allured him beyond the limits of parsimony, nay, even beyond the limits of prudence, the taste for building. In all other things his economy was such as we might call by a harsher name if we did not reflect that his funds were drawn from a heavily taxed people, and that it was impossible for him, without excessive tyranny, to keep up at once a formidable army and a splendid court. Considered as an administrator, Frederick had undoubtedly many titles to praise. Order was strictly maintained throughout his dominions, 
property was secure. A great liberty of speaking and of writing was allowed. Confident in the irresistible strength derived from a great army, the king looked down on malcontents and libelers with a wise disdain, and gave little encouragement to spies and informers. When he was told of the disaffection of one of his subjects, he merely asked, How many thousand men can he bring into the field? He once saw a crowd staring at something on a wall. He rode up and found that the object of curiosity was a scurrilous placard against himself. The placard had been posted up so high that it was not easy to read it. Frederick ordered his attendants to take it down and put it lower. My people and I, he said, have come to an agreement which satisfied us both. They are to say what they please, and I am to do what I please. No person would have dared to publish in London satires on George the Second approaching to the atrocity of those satires on Frederick, which the booksellers at Berlin sold with impunity. One bookseller sent to the palace a copy of the most stinging lampoon that perhaps was ever written in the world, the memoirs of Voltaire, published by Beaumarchais, and asked for His Majesty's orders. Do not advertise it in an offensive manner, said the king, but sell it by all means. I hope it will pay you well. Even among statesmen accustomed to the license of a free press, such steadfastness of mind as this is not very common. It is due also to the memory of Frederick to say that he earnestly laboured to secure to his people the great blessing of cheap and speedy justice. He was one of the first rulers who abolished the cruel and absurd practice of torture. No sentence of death, pronounced by the ordinary tribunals, was executed without his sanction, and his sanction, except in cases of murder, was rarely given. Towards his troops he acted in a very different manner. Military offences were punished with such barbarous scourging that to be shot was considered by the Prussian soldier as a secondary punishment. Indeed, the principle which pervaded Frederick's whole policy was this, that the more severely the army is governed, the safer it is to treat the rest of the community with lenity. Religious persecution was unknown under his government, unless some foolish and unjust restrictions which lay upon the Jews may be regarded as forming an exception. His policy with respect to the Catholics of Silesia presented an honourable contrast to the policy which, under very similar circumstances, England long followed with respect to the Catholics of Ireland. Every form of religion and irreligion found an asylum in his states. The scoffer whom the parliaments of France had sentenced to a cruel death was consoled by a commission in the Prussian service. The Jesuit, who could show his face nowhere else, who in Britain was still subject to penal laws, who was prescribed by France, Spain, Portugal, and Naples, who had been given up even by the Vatican, found safety and the means of subsistence in the Prussian dominions. Most of the vices of Frederick's administration resolved themselves into one vice, the spirit of meddling. The indefatigable activity of his intellect, his dictatorial temper, his military habits all inclined him to this great fault. He drilled his people as he drilled his grenadiers. Capital and industry were diverted from their natural direction by a crowd of preposterous regulations. There was a monopoly of coffee, a monopoly of tobacco, a monopoly of refined sugar. The public money of which the king was generally so sparing was lavishly spent in ploughing bogs, in planting mulberry trees amidst the sand, in bringing sheep from Spain to improve the Saxon wool, in bestowing prizes for fine yarn, in building manufactories of porcelain, manufactories of carpets, manufactories of hardware, manufactories of lace. Neither the experience of other rulers nor his own could ever teach him that something more than an edict and a grant of public money was required to create a Lyon, a Brussels, or a Birmingham. For his commercial policy, however, there was some excuse. He had on his side illustrious examples and popular prejudice. Grievously as he erred, he erred in company with his age. In other departments his meddling was altogether without apology. He interfered with the course of justice as well as with the course of trade, 
and set up his own crude notions of equity against the law as expounded by the unanimous voice of the gravest magistrates it never occurred to him that men whose lives were passed in adjudicating on questions of civil right were more likely to form correct opinions on such questions than a prince whose attention was divided among a thousand objects and who had never read a law-book through the resistance opposed to him by the tribunals inflamed him to fury he reviled his chancellor he kicked the shins of his judges he did not it is true intend to act unjustly he firmly believed that he was doing right and defending the cause of the poor against the wealthy yet this well-meant meddling probably did far more harm than all the explosions of his evil passions during the whole of his long reign we could make shift to live under a debauchee or a tyrant but to be ruled by a busybody is more than human nature can bear the same passion for directing and regulating appeared in every part of the king's policy every lad of a certain station in life was forced to go to certain schools within the prussian dominions if a young prussian repaired though but for a few weeks to leiden or Göttingen for the purpose of study the offence was punished with civil disabilities and sometimes with the confiscation of property nobody was to travel without the royal permission if the permission were granted the pocket money of the tourist was fixed by royal ordinance a merchant might take with him two hundred and fifty reichsdollars in gold a noble was allowed to take four hundred for it may be observed in passing that frederick studiously kept up the old distinction between the nobles and the community in speculation he was a french philosopher but in action a german prince he talked and wrote about the privileges of blood in the style of sie but in practice no chapter in the empire looked with a keener eye to genealogies and quarterings such was frederick the ruler but there was another frederick the frederick of rheinsberg the fiddler and flute-player the poetaster and metaphysician amidst the cares of state the king had retained his passion for music for reading for writing for literary society to these amusements he devoted all the time that he could snatch from the business of war and government and perhaps more light is thrown on his character by what passed during his hours of relaxation than by his battles or his laws it was the just boast of schiller that in his country no augustus no lorenzo had watched over the infancy of poetry the rich and energetic language of luther driven by the latin from schools of pedants and by the french from the palaces of kings had taken refuge among the people of the powers of that language frederick had no notion he generally spoke of it and of those who used it with a contempt of ignorance his library consisted of french books at his table nothing was heard but french conversation the associates of his hours of relaxation were for the most part foreigners british furnished to the royal circle two distinguished men born in the highest rank and driven by civil dissensions from the land to which under happier circumstances their talents and virtues might have been a source of strength and glory george keith earl marshal of scotland had taken arms for the house of stuart in seventeen fifteen and his younger brother james then only seventeen years old had fought gallantly by his side when all was lost they retired together to the continent rode from country to country served under various standards and so bore themselves as to win the respect and good will of many who had no love for the jacobite cause their long wanderings terminated at potsdam nor had frederick any associates who deserved or obtained so large a share of his esteem they were not only accomplished men but nobles and warriors capable of serving him in war and diplomacy as well as of amusing him at supper alone of all his companions they appear never to have had reason to complain of his demeanour towards them some of those who knew the palace best pronounced that lord marischal was the only human being whom frederick ever really loved italy sent to the parties at potsdam the ingenious and amiable algarotti and bastiani the most crafty cautious and servile of abbes but the greater part of the society which frederick had assembled around him was drawn from france 
Maubertuis had acquired some celebrity by the journey which he had made to Lapland, for the purpose of ascertaining by actual measurement the shape of our planet. He was placed in the chair of the Academy of Berlin, a humble imitation of the renowned Academy of Paris. Baculard d'Arnaud, a young poet who was thought to have given promise of great things, had been induced to quit his country and to reside at the Prussian court. The Marquis d'Argent was among the king's favourite companions, on account, as it should seem, of the strong opposition between their characters. The parts of d'Argent were good, and his manners those of a finished French gentleman, but his whole soul was dissolved in sloth, timidity, and self-indulgence. He was one of that abject class of minds which are superstitious without being religious. Hating Christianity with a rancor which made him incapable of rational inquiry, unable to see in the harmony and beauty of the universe the traces of divine power and wisdom, he was the slave of dreams and omens, would not sit down to table with thirteen in company, turn pale if the salt fell towards him, begged his guests not to cross their knives and forks on their plates, and would not for the world commence a journey on Friday. His health was a subject of constant anxiety to him. Whenever his head ached or his pulse beat quick, his dastardly fears and effeminate precautions were the jest of all Berlin. All this suited the king's purpose admirably. He wanted somebody by whom he might be amused and whom he might despise. When he wished to pass half an hour in easy, polished conversation, D'Argent was an excellent companion. When he wanted to vein his spleen and contempt, D'Argent was an excellent butt. With these associates, and others of the same class, Frederick loved to spend the time which he could steal from public cares. He wished his supper parties to be gay and easy. He invited his guests to lay aside all restraint, and to forget that he was at the head of a hundred and sixty thousand soldiers, and was absolute master of the life and liberty of all who sat at meat with him. There was, therefore, at these parties the outward show of ease. The wit and learning of the company were ostentatiously displayed. The discussions on history and literature were often highly interesting. But the absurdity of all the religions known among men was the chief topic of conversation, and the audacity with which doctrines and names venerated throughout Christendom were treated on these occasions startled even persons accustomed to the society of French and English freethinkers. Real liberty, however, or real affection, was in this brilliant society not to be found. Absolute kings seldom have friends, and Frederick's faults were such as, even where perfect equality exists, make friendship extremely precarious. He had indeed many qualities, which on a first acquaintance were captivating. His conversation was lively, his manners, to those whom he desired to please, were even caressing. No man could flatter with more delicacy, no man succeeded more completely in inspiring those who approached him with vague hopes of some great advantage from his kindness. But under this fair exterior he was a tyrant, suspicious, disdainful, and malevolent. He had one taste which may be pardoned in a boy, but which when habitually and deliberately indulged in by a man of mature age and strong understanding is almost invariably the sign of a bad heart a taste for severe, practical jokes. If a courtier was fond of dress, oil was flung over his richest suit. If he was fond of money, some prank was invented to make him disperse more than he could spare. If he were hypochondriacal, he was made to believe that he had the dropsy. If he had particularly set his heart on visiting a place, a letter was forged to frighten him from going thither. These things, it may be said, are trifles. They are so but they are indications, not to be mistaken, of a nature to which the sight of human suffering and human degradation is an agreeable excitement. Frederick had a keen eye for the foibles of others, and loved to communicate his discoveries. He had some talent for sarcasm, and considerable talent in detecting the sore places where sarcasm would be most acutely felt. His vanity, as well as his malignity, found gratification in the vexation and confusion of those who smarted under his caustic jests. Yet in truth his success on these occasions 
belonged quite as much to the king as to the wit. We read that Commodus descended, sword in hand, into the arena against a wretched gladiator, armed only with a foil of lead, and after shedding the blood of the helpless victim, struck medals to commemorate the inglorious victory. The triumphs of Frederick in the war of repartee were of much the same kind. How to deal with him was the most puzzling of questions. To appear constrained in his presence was to disobey his commands and to spoil his amusement. Yet if his associates were enticed by his graciousness to indulge in the familiarity of a cordial intimacy, he was certain to make them repent of their presumption by some cruel humiliation. To resent his affronts was perilous, yet not to resent them was to deserve and to invite them. In his view, those who mutinied were insolent and ungrateful, those who submitted were curs made to receive bones and kickings with the same fawning patience. It is indeed difficult to conceive how anything short of the rage of hunger should have induced men to bear the misery of being the associates of the great king. It was no lucrative post. His majesty was as severe and economical in his friendships as in the other charges of his establishment, and as unlikely to give a rix dollar too much for his guests as for his dinners. The sum which he allowed to a poet or a philosopher was the very smallest sum for which such poet or philosopher could be induced to sell himself into slavery. And the bondsman might think himself fortunate if what had been so grudgingly given was not, after years of suffering, rudely and arbitrarily withdrawn. Potsdam was, in truth, what it was called by one of its most illustrious inmates, the Palace of Alcina. At the first glance it seemed to be a delightful spot where every intellectual and physical enjoyment awaited the happy adventurer. Every newcomer was received with eager hospitality, intoxicated with flattery, encouraged to expect prosperity and greatness. It was in vain that a long succession of favourites who had entered that abode with delight and hope, and who, after a short term of delusive happiness, had been doomed to expiate their folly by years of wretchedness and degradation, raised their voices to warn the aspirant who approached the charmed threshold. Some had wisdom enough to discover the truth early, and spirit enough to fly without looking back. Others lingered on to a cheerless and unhonoured old age. We have no hesitation in saying that the poorest author of that time in London, sleeping on a bulk, dining in a cellar, with a cravat of paper and a skewer for a shirt-pin, was a happier man than any of the literary inmates of Frederick's court. But of all who entered the enchanted garden in the inebriation of delight, and quitted it in agonies of rage and shame, the most remarkable was Voltaire. Many circumstances had made him desirous of finding a home at a distance from his country. His fame had raised him up enemies. His sensibility gave them a formidable advantage over him. They were, indeed, contemptible assailants. Of all that they wrote against him, nothing has survived except what he has himself preserved. But the constitution of his mind resembled the constitution of those bodies in which the slightest scratch of a bramble or the bite of a gnat never fails to fester. Though his reputation was rather raised than lowered by the abuse of such writers as Fréron and Desfontaines, though the vengeance which he took on Fréron and Desfontaines was such that scourging, branding, and pillorying would have been a trifle to it, there is reason to believe that they gave him far more pain than he ever gave them. Though he enjoyed during his own lifetime the reputation of a classic, though he was extolled by his contemporaries above all poets, philosophers, and historians, though his works were read with as much delight and admiration at Moscow and Westminster, at Florence and Stockholm, as at Paris itself, he was yet tormented by that restless jealousy which had seemed to belong only to minds burning with the desire of fame and yet conscious of impotence. To men of letters who could by no possibility be his rivals, he was, if they behaved well to him, not merely just, not merely courteous, but often a hearty friend and a munificent benefactor. But to every writer who rose to a celebrity approaching his own, he became either a disguised or an avowed enemy.
he slyly depreciated Montesquieu and Buffon. He publicly and with violent outrage made war on Rousseau. Nor had he the art of hiding his feelings under the semblance of good humour or of contempt. With all his great talents and all his long experience of the world, he had no more self-command than a petted child or a hysterical woman. Whenever he was mortified, he exhausted the whole rhetoric of anger and sorrow to express his mortification. His torrents of bitter words, his stamping and cursing, his grimaces and his tears of rage, were a rich feast to those abject natures whose delight is in the agonies of powerful spirits and in the abasement of immortal names. These creatures had now found out a way of galling him to the very quick. In one walk, at least, it had been admitted by envy itself that he was without a living competitor. Since Racine had been laid among the great men whose dust made the holy precinct of Port Royal holier, no tragic poet had appeared who could contest the palm with the author of Zaire, of Alcir, and of Merope. At length the rival was announced. Old Crébillon, who many years before had obtained some theatrical success, and who had long been forgotten, came forth from his garret in one of the meanest lanes near the Rue Saint-Antoine, and was welcomed by the acclamations of envious men of letters and of a capricious populace. A thing called Catiline, which he had written in his retirement, was acted with boundless applause. Of this execrable piece, it is sufficient to say that the plot turns on a love affair, carried on in all the forms of Scuderi, between Catiline, whose confidant is the praetor Lentulus, and Tullia, the daughter of Cicero. The theatre resounded with acclamations. The king pensioned the successful poet, and the coffee-houses pronounced that Voltaire was a clever man, but that the real tragic inspiration, the celestial fire which had glowed in Corneille and Racine, was to be found in Crébillon alone. The blow went to Voltaire's heart. Had his wisdom and fortitude been in proportion to the fertility of his intellect, and to the brilliancy of his wit, he would have seen that it was out of the power of all the puffers and detractors in Europe to put Catiline above Zaire, but he had none of the magnanimous patience with which Milton and Bentley left their claims to the unerring judgment of time. He eagerly engaged in an undignified competition with Crébillon, and produced a series of plays on the same subjects which his rival had treated. These pieces were coolly received. Angry with the court, angry with the capital, Voltaire began to find pleasure in the prospect of exile. His attachment for Madame du Châtelet long prevented him from executing his purpose. Her death set him at liberty, and he determined to take refuge at Berlin. To Berlin he was invited by a series of letters couched in terms of the most enthusiastic friendship and admiration. For once the rigid parsimony of Frederick seemed to have relaxed. Honours, honourable offices, a liberal pension, a well-served table, stately apartments under a royal roof, were offered in return for the pleasure and honour which were expected from the society of the first wit of the age. A thousand louis were remitted for the charges of the journey. No ambassador setting out from Berlin for a court of the first rank had ever been more amply supplied but Voltaire was not satisfied. At a later period, when he possessed an ample fortune, he was one of the most liberal of men, but till his means had become equal to his wishes, his greediness for lucre was unrestrained either by justice or by shame. He had the effrontery to ask for a thousand louis more, in order to enable him to bring his niece, Madame Denis, the ugliest of coquettes, in his company. The indelicate rapacity of the poet produced its natural effect on the severe and frugal king. The answer was a dry refusal. I did not, said his majesty, solicit the honour of the lady's society. On this Voltaire went off into a paroxysm of childish rage. Was there ever such avarice? He has hundreds of tubs full of dollars in his vaults, and haggles with me about a poor thousand louis. It seemed that the negotiation would be broken off, but Frederick, with great dexterity, affected indifference, 
and seemed inclined to transfer his idolatry to Baculard d'Arnaud. His Majesty even wrote some bad verses of which the sense was that Voltaire was the setting sun and that Arnaud was rising. Good-natured friends soon carried the lines to Voltaire. He was in his bed. He jumped out in his shirt, danced about the room with rage, and sent for his passport and his post-horses. It was not difficult to foresee the end of a connection which had such a beginning. End of chapter 3